What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, board certified psychiatrist, bringing you mental health content here on YouTube. Now, before I get into this topic today that's really exciting, I think it's really gonna entice you guys, I wanna ask that anyone who's not a member of this community, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you've been watching the videos and you like them, please consider becoming a subscriber. It really helps me to know that this information is valuable to you. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for all of the love and support. It does mean the world to me. Now today's topic is a good one, and that's because the diagnosis of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD, is well established in the psychiatric community. Most practitioners agree with it, most practitioners are willing to treat it. Now, not only is it well accepted, but the incidence of ADHD in the United States has been steadily increasing over the last 10 years. So we're going to see that chart here. There's a steady incline in the number of people being diagnosed with ADHD. Now, some would even say this is a new epidemic, but I'm not sure, right? We'll see. The use of psychostimulants, so specifically things like mixed amphetamine salts and methylphenidate, is well established as a treatment modality for this particular disorder. Now, although it's common practice today, we're here to discuss what is known about the potential neurotoxicity of ADHD medications. So if you're excited for that and you want to know more about the potential neurotoxicity, stay tuned in the net for the next sections. Before I get too deep into the research on the neurotoxicity of stimulant medications and stimulants in general, I want to first talk about what is a psychostimulant because many people might not know what I mean when I say psychostimulant. So when I'm talking about psychostimulants, I'm talking about two specific formulations, generally methylphenidate, also abbreviated as MPH, and mixed amphetamine salts, such as Adderall, for example. Now, these medications remain the most effective and widely used treatments for ADHD. And the medications function primarily by blocking the reuptake of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. And by doing so, they increase dopamine stimulation at the postsynaptic receptors. So... All of this extra dopamine is able to stimulate these receptors, and that is largely what we think is responsible for the increases or the benefits of the medication. Now, these medications work by increasing attention and reducing impulsivity. So they increase attention, they reduce impulsivity, but the key point that I want to make here is that the long-term implications of consistent use of psychostimulants is largely unknown. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next section. A major topic that many people are going to be concerned about when it comes to using a controlled and dangerous substance such as a psychostimulant is whether or not this increases the risk for addiction, right? Does this make somebody more susceptible to developing a substance use disorder in the future? Now, most lines of evidence in the literature would have you believe that these medications do not promote substance use disorder in later life and they even might decrease the potential for future substance abuse. So this is encouraging, and most of the data, again, indicates this. Now, I've also found similar lines of evidence that indicate the opposite, right? So it depends on which research you, you look at, and you can always find research to support your own point of view, of course. So in this case, I've also been able to find some evidence to say that the opposite is true, but the consensus in the field of psychiatry and addiction medicine is that these these drugs, these medications, psychostimulants, do not increase the risk for future substance use or substance abuse. Now, what we do know is that drugs that function in a similar manner, right, drugs that function in a similar way to psychostimulants that we're prescribing here as treatment, actually have molecular and structural changes to the neurons in the brain. So they do cause molecular and structural changes to the neurons. It's unknown if this also occurs when stimulant medications are used to treat ADHD. And in the next section, that's what we're going to talk about. What are the neuronal changes or stimulant changes that are induced by these medications? Okay, so we've made it to the exciting part, guys, because you probably want to know what are these neuronal changes? What are the changes we see in, in, we see in the brain structure of individuals and animal models? when they're exposed to amphetamines or methylphenidate. So I want to start with an oldie but a goodie, and that is methamphetamine. So methamphetamine is a commonly abused street or recreational drug 
that is known to be neurotoxic. This is well established in the literature and the research, and several studies indicate this in animal models as well. Now, when we look at animal models, and unfortunately we mostly have animal models to base this off of, and we can't always extrapolate that to human studies, but we do have to be mindful that if this is causing significant changes in animal models, there may be the potential to cause those same changes in human subjects, right? People who are using this medication. Now, recent exposure to amphetamine has been shown to cause impairments in the development of dendritic branching. So dendrites are responsible for receiving signals from other neurons, and this can last up to three months after stopping methylphenidate. So when we expose these mice to methylphenidate, there is impairment in the development of dendritic branching up to three months after stopping the medication. So that's one of the changes we might see. Now in mice, there's also evidence that methylphenidate can cause loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. Now that's a lot of detail there. You might not need to know all of that, but the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, when they go away or die or whatever you wanna say here, are damaged in some way, it can lead to something called Parkinson's disease, which many of you should be familiar with, and it's a very debilitating disease that causes a lot of significant problems for individuals. So that's our second piece of evidence. Other groups have shown other things as well, specifically things regarding nerve growth factors and brain-derived neurotropic factor in the frontal cortex. So there actually are alterations in the amount of nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotropic factor in the frontal cortex when methylphenidate is used. Now, when neurons, this is, this is isolated neurons from the prefrontal cortex, are exposed to methylphenidate, it alters their electrical activity. Methylphenidate was found to reduce electrical activity and it, it often persists in a dose-dependent fashion, so again, dose matters, even 10 weeks after exposure. So even 10 weeks after these neurons were exposed to methylphenidate, we can still see this reduced electrical activity. Again, a concerning factor if you're one of the people who is using a stimulant-based medication. Now, in rats, we also see that methylphenidate is, is associated with a decreased response to normal stimuli and increased response to adverse stimuli. So this is a behavioral change that we're seeing in these rats, and that's significant too. Now we need to be careful concluding or extrapolating this information to humans, but the studies conducted in animal models seem to be clear that there are significant neuronal changes, some of which are detrimental, such as loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, possibly increasing the risk for Parkinson's disease. So these are the lines of evidence that we have, again, mostly from animal models, maybe not the greatest data, but still some cause for pause, in my opinion, when it comes to prescribing stimulant medication. So what can we kind of say about the final part here? What can we kind of wrap up and say about the risk of stimulant medication in terms of neuronal changes or possible neurotoxicity? So we know that when dopamine is available in excess, such as the case of using drugs like cocaine, it results in detrimental changes to neurons. Again, it's established in things like cocaine, meth methamphetamine, that there are detrimental changes to the brain that do occur. Now, unfortunately, of course, when we start talking about stimulant medications that are used to treat ADHD, the long-term effects of chronic exposure to lower doses, that's very important because I said some of these changes are uh, occur in a dose-dependent fashion. So the chronic exposure to low-dose stimulant medication remains largely unknown in human studies. Unfortunately, this is not something that would be easy to study. It wouldn't be like, let's see how much stimulant medication we can give you and to see when it becomes neurotoxic and starts causing problems for you. So at this point, we really don't know, but what, we can, what I can say, again, is that this gives me a little bit of pause when talking about ADHD treatment because there is some evidence to support the idea that these medications may be neurotoxic and may be causing detrimental changes in neurons that may not be reversible. So I'm gonna hold it there for you guys. I would love to see the comments and questions about this topic because I think it's one that's going to excite people and I think it's one that's pretty controversial. I mean, there's not many doctors or psychiatrists out there saying that stimulant medications may be de detrimental to your brain but we'll find out in the comment section. Thanks again for watching, and if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so.